there is no a sense that right now, increasingly, we are all funneling our 18-year-olds into a certain path, and that path is college. We are now telling 18-year-olds they must go to college. They have to go to a very particular kind of college, even if it won't help them, even yep. if it won't give them much of an education, even if it won't set them up to have a prosperous life. And there's no law saying you have to go to college yet because Elizabeth Warren didn't win. But, you know, there, there is a, a big social force. So I do wonder if there were a social force that said, hey, you do two years at least of service, if that would give us some kind of common culture, common love of our country, some firearms training, which wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to defend our cherished political traditions and freedoms. You know, I, there, I just notice increasingly in the country, there's so little that binds us together. We don't even have a common TV culture anymore. We don't even have a common movie culture. I mean, we're, we're becoming so isolated that perhaps a, a common sense of service uh, might be a better alternative than the other kinds of common institutions we're being pushed into uh, that, that probably won't serve the country that well. True. I, I actually agree with that uh, to some extent. It doesn't have to be military service. Uh, I've been disturbed during this kind of uh, lockdown or crisis or whatever it is. I've been disturbed at the kind of childish view of liberty that we've developed. I mean, liberty is not a point unto itself. It is a, a way of living life. It's a way of pursuing happiness. It's a way of preserving uh, the the idea of the individual as a key actor and as an end in himself. And I don't think that uh, asking everybody to serve in some way uh, is, is such a bad idea. I, I have to agree with Knowles on this. I, I don't like this idea. Liberty is not like just you're not the boss of me. Liberty is a way of respecting one another. It is a way of looking yeah. at it, not just at yourself, but at looking at the other guy. And it wouldn't be such a bad thing if we could inculcate that a little bit through service, through action, instead of sending people off to colleges where guys who've never done anything for anybody teach them about systems that have never worked anywhere and basically, <laughs> you know, uh, brainwash them into nonsense. If you have to do something, if you have to do something useful uh, for everybody, I, I don't think that's such a bad thing. And I think that really the only thing that's ever stood between us and that have been unions and the fact that they don't want us to find out that we could do their jobs for them. Um, you know, I, I have problems with the, with the basic idea of, of national service, as, as Jeremy does, namely because we, we do have a form of national service in this country, which is called public school. Whenever you put people in the, in the <laughs> position in this country of being drafted into public institutions, it typically doesn't go well because it turns out that the same people you guys despise at the college level uh, tend to run the public institutions into which we inculcate people, unless we are talking explicitly about the military. And as Jeremy sort of suggests, I mean, the founders were not super comfortable with the idea of a standing military altogether in the first place. Uh, and then the idea that we are going to be you know, drafting presumably tens of millions of Americans into military service where they live in barracks under the harsh rule of government without any consent of their own. This used to be a fairly controversial idea. Right? It was pretty controversial throughout the Civil War. It was controversial yeah. in World War I. Uh, it was less controversial in World War II because there was an active threat against the American homeland after Pearl Harbor. But the draft became so controversial again, then we did away with the draft. And I, and I think to, to good effect. The, the big problem that you guys are talking about solving is a problem I don't think that can be solved by government. What you're talking about is, again, a lack of social fabric, which I've talked about a lot, the lack of, of feelings that we owe one another. And those things have to exist outside the bounds of government. Government cannot really create that. Uh, and in Israel, it does exist outside the bounds of government, but it's also a different thing, again, because Israel is under existential threat at literally all times. I mean, at, at all times, even people who are, who are no longer serving the military are basically off duty. I mean, if, you, yeah. if you're up to the age of 50, then you can be called back into the military pretty much uh, if there's any sort of emergency at any time. And for good reason. The place is a postage stamp and it's surrounded on all sides by hundreds of millions of people who want to wipe it off the map. Thank God we don't have that situation in America. Uh, I'm, I'd be a little bit, I'm always not eager to give more authority to government to place us in, into institutions that we don't voluntarily go. It usually doesn't go all that great. Yeah. The revolution is beautiful because there wasn't conscription during the revolution. It was the people who wanted a free country who went out and got us a free country. Uh, and, and I would also, then I, I really would reinforce what you just said. The people who run uh, coercive organizations are always coerced. They're, it's the coercers, people who want that, who are drawn to that. And Drew, I, I would disagree a little bit with you about the nature of liberty. I think it's very popular right now to uh, speak against liberty. You know, liberty isn't just being free. No, no, it pretty much is. American liberty is, is the cowboy. American liberty is, I'm, leave me alone to do what I want. Leave me alone to pursue my own interests. The fact that sometimes we see, uh, obviously, as with anything in a fallen world and an imperfect world, uh, liberty sometimes breeds bad attitudes. Liberty sometimes breeds bad behaviors. Uh, I think that we run a risk sometimes of pointing to those bad 
attitudes or bad behaviors and saying that's not what liber that's not liberty but it is liberty that that is just one aspect of liberty the worst aspect as opposed to the better aspect but the idea of stay off my yard leave me alone let me do what i want let me pursue what i want uh, the frontier uh, the idea of i'm going to leave this behind and go to the frontier where i can be free i mean that is the animating idea behind the United States. There, there is a difference, though, and you know, one one could have a debate about liberty for a long time. But the kind of old idea of liberty that we had until very recently was actually ties in with education. It ties in with the liberal arts. The idea was that w- when you're born, you're not exactly free. A little baby needs his mother. Little children are slaves to their passions, and only through learning how to tame your passions, tame your appetites, practice the virtues, do you acquire freedom, and you you can have it an exalted freedom. Whereas there's this kind of new idea that that liberty is the same as libertinism, that actually when you go and, and just pursue your own appetites willy-nilly, then you're really free. But actually what we find, like any drug addict, right, you can go and shoot up all the drugs, but then you find out you're a slave to those drugs. And, and this is an older idea of freedom. And, and to Ben's point, you know, Ben, you said that government cannot, uh, government rules or policies cannot encourage this kind of culture, but you, you certainly can see it discourage a, a common unity. So just to give the instance of this libertinism, during the sexual revolution, you had something like no-fault divorce. You had things like abortion on demand, which we all oppose. You had things like the sexual revolution, which we would oppose. That encouraged this isolation that has destroyed our common culture. Presumably, if you reversed some of those decisions, if, if you made it a little bit more difficult to get divorced, if you made it a little bit more difficult to just follow our own passions, then you would be able to regain those sorts of issues. You know, I, I know that we like to draw, draw this big distinction between culture and politics, and that's a worthy distinction, but th- it's a little bit blurrier than I think some of us want to believe. And, and I don't I, think any of us wants to pursue a liberty that is just doing whatever we want all the time, even when it's, it's very harmful to us. Well, I mean, obviously, I, nobody I wants a liberty that, that is not restricted in any way. I think that the, the big question, and this goes back to a debate that we've been having in an ongoing fashion for the last several years at this point, is this sort of Adrian Vermeule government as great educator and uh, and government as virtue inculcator. And I'm very uncomfortable with that idea because historically, government has been much more of an oppressor than it has been a great inculcator of virtue. Uh, and the, the fact is that religious institutions typically have been that which filled the gap. And I agree with you, the government can wreck all of that but I think that if you give government more power, it's more likely to wreck more of it. Meaning that, that the yep. big story of the 1950s and 1960s was not that government decided to re-educate everybody in a particular direction. It's that government decided to undermine all of the institutions that allowed the education toward virtue in the first place. It was government undermining church. It was government undermining marriage. It was government incentivizing bad behavior. Government gained power during the 1960s. It didn't give up power during the 1960s to control your behavior. But government it, decided instead it was going to pay people to be single mothers. If you're going to talk about you know, the, 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 destro- uh, the destruction of marriage in America, I think you'd be much better off focusing. I mean, listen, I think no-fault divorce is idiotic. But with that said, I think that no-fault divorce is less of a problem in American life than the government actively incentivizing women to give birth to children out of wedlock, just as a matter of statistics. I just think it it cuts a little bit both ways because you're absolutely right. In a certain sense, in a huge sense, the government gained a lot of power in the 60s. But you also got this idea that what happens in a person's bedroom is no business of the government, when that was not true in the United States for a long time. I mean, for, for, just to use one debate that keeps coming up on this, this topic, which is porn. You know, we've had laws against pornography in this country from the very, very beginning. We still have laws against pornography in this country, even if they are not enforced. But some were enforced relatively recently during the Bush administration. That would be an instance w- where the government is actually, in a certain sense, ceding power, saying we have nothing to say about this issue. And by ceding that power, it gave people a kind of libertinism that I think has uh, has made our liberty situation a little bit worse. I just think that the whole idea that there is a relationship between the liberal arts and liberty, of course, that we were trying to instill in people the virtues of that made for liberty. Uh, but I think the idea that it was all people, educated people with liberal arts uh, educations uh, who were the real uh, bulwark for liberty in this country is just not true. I think that we always talk about this question in the context of the 50s and the 60s. And that's 20 years of the 200 plus year history of the country. The vast majority of the time that people in this country were free, no one could know what was going on in your bedroom because it was a frontier nation. Because people were out away from government and they were having therefore to rely on things like small community. They were having to rely on their neighbor, even though their neighbor might be miles away from them. They were having to rely on uh, their religion and their faith 
And they weren't relying on things like education or forced service. There, there was no education and there was nowhere to serve. You, you, you were a free person uh, not being shaped by government. And instead, you had to therefore be shaped by reality, by nature. You had to be I, shaped by, uh, and you had to be shaped by more local institutions. I, I have to take issue with some of this. I, I, you and I, Jeremy, have a, a lot of sympathy on this issue of, uh, of liberty being, uh, being left alone. I mean, I think that you're absolutely right about this. But liberty has always been, has always been generated uh, by ideas. And it really was ideas that filter into the common, uh, that become common property, yeah. even of people who don't have the education. It's those ideas that really have made people free. And key to that one of those ideas has, has been the idea of the interior life of an individual as being an end of itself. The fact that you are you and I'm me and that we we experience a life, that that is something that doesn't need any explanation, doesn't need any defense. And I think in order to have that idea in operation, we do have to have a sense of respect for one another. I mean, you just, you cannot have uh, liberty for me and not for thee. And that's one of the reasons uh, that, for instance, these these rights that people suddenly have, uh, the right to of gay marriage, where you can then go and sue somebody uh, if he doesn't accept your vision of life, if he doesn't accept your behavior as good, you can then sue him. That That is uh, damaging to liberty, that actually is not extending but liberty. But that, to Ben's and point, I think that's that, a product that, of if, government. If, no, no, wait. These are two separate conversations, though, that we're having. They got kind of got melded together. The threat of government, which Ben is talking about, obviously, obviously always a problem. And it is definitely a drawback to any idea of common service. And I completely accept that. I'm not sure whether it can be gotten around, but I think that's true. But it's but it, it is not the same thing as the way we behave and where those ideas are going to come from. We're in a very, very damaging and dangerous situation where we have lost our religion to some degree. We've certainly lost any kind of binding uh, sense of religion. Government cannot replace that. Government, we have a constitution that was built for religious people. And that is something we're really going to have to address. And I think that uh, the thing that Knowles is talking about, which is now this bubbling uh, debate on the left, of uh, how are we going to reinstill these, I these common ideas of good uh, without doing it through the iron fist of government, this is a difficult debate, but we better be having it because we cannot survive as a free nation without an idea of virtue, without a common sense that there's something bigger than each of us. I, and I think I think it's, it's a very, very difficult thing. Libertarianism is not going to do it, but obviously neither is theocracy. Somewhere between those two ideas, there's got to be some way of restoring some sense of unity because we are really a daggers drawn and we can't continue that way for very long. Yeah, I guess I'm just curious I don't disagree that we're a nation that's lost its religion. I don't disagree that our constitution is for a, a religious people, that our way of government is for a religious people. I guess what I'm not sure about is what is the alternative that's being proposed? If well, well uh, I can give you a little bit of the alternative because there's, there's one vision of America, which is that it's only the Wild West and it's John Wayne in a saloon with a pistol. But that isn't only America. It's not even the, the oldest version of America. You know, America begins really in New England and on the East Coast, and th those are decidedly less Wild West places, and part of Western expansion was, was expanding across the country and, and uh, spreading out a little bit. Uh, in, in those New England uh, towns and cities in particular, there was in, intense social cohesion. There was a, a, a real authentic politics where people thought they could make their own political decisions, that, that the, you know, we didn't simply have to pursue our own individual ends ad infinitum without any sense of having a common purpose. But I think the key here is the localism of it. You could call it localism or federalism or subsidiarity. The idea that these kinds of decisions are absolutely within the scope of politics, and they should be. But it, it, when you make those decisions at the f national level or the federal level, or even worse, the international level, that those decisions are going to be heavy handed. They could become tyrannical, that it's, it's good for us to have a politics and a sense of common virtue, but uh, it's probably safer for us to make those decisions more locally. That's very much in the American tradition. On that note, and on that note, can I just chime in since we went after Trump for going after Joe Scarborough? I have to wave the Trump flag here for just a minute. This thing that he brought out, I, I've loved during this uh, Chinese flu epidemic that that he has remained a federalist, whether yes. he knows what that word means or not. Yeah. He has just said, let the states do what they're going to do. And it has revealed where the states are badly run and where they're well run. 
But when he did that thing where he dialed back regulations and contained in that executive order uh, is a bill of rights of regulations, which I think should become constitutional since we're being governed by all these regulatory agencies instead of by Congress. I think that uh, that that is a brilliant thing that he's done. I cannot remember in my lifetime anyone ever meeting a crisis by dialing back the power of government. Uh, that is that's insane. And I, I just think it's something that we can celebrate in the midst of, you know, the mourning of the people who have died and uh, the complete difficulty of our uh, of our economic situation. Uh, only Trump would have done this. I, I mean, with all the stuff that he does, that's crazy. He then does these wonderful golden yep. things that I just think we have to pause for a minute and recognize because it is something that conservatives, it's a holy grail that conservatives have gone after of don't let the crisis be used to oppress us. And Trump has actually done that. Well, hey there. Now's the time when you hit that like button for me so we can keep smoking cigars and drinking whiskey for your amusement. Or in Ben's case, eating popcorn directly off the floor. He's weird.